Imagine, you come home from a long day. You settle in before having a nice hot supper with your family and maybe some of your rich friends or just some guests. Then you go upstairs to shower and wind down for the night, only to realize that your house was burglarized while you were stuffing your face. While you were cleaning off your plate, they were cleaning out your closet. I know that I don't typically order a side of robbery for dinner, but then again, I do enjoy the occasional heist for dessert. But those two dishes were always on the main menu for the dinner set gang. Yes, their name was the dinner set gang and they were good. They were quick too. I mean, these guys would come and go faster than me after 20 minutes of foreplay. They were a gang of disciplined professionals that consisted mainly of Peter Salerno and his brother-in-law Dominic Latella. Peter was a master thief and Dominic was his trusted lookout man and sometimes they brought along Peter Salerno's other relative, Carmine Stanzioni, as a getaway driver. Their family relation helped cement the trust and bond between Peter and Dominic during their criminal exploits, which they developed after marrying two Italian twins, the Savino sisters, Gloria and Sandra. The police even had to admit that Peter is the prototypical standard of what every cat burglar attempted to be, because he was almost flawless. The police also claimed that the duo made the same kind of money stealing as Wall Street professionals. They would rob folks down south in Palm Beach, Florida, and then follow their victim crowd as they migrated north for the different seasons before again robbing them in New York and Connecticut too. And I'm referencing the, the, the crowd itself, not the same victims just over and over. I want to clarify that. They were originally inspired and taught by a gentleman named Frank Bova, who was an army ranger during World War II that hunted and stole documents from the Nazi regime. They developed a brilliant plan to rob the rich and elites that involved the social life of their victims. From what I understand, in rich folk etiquette, you socialize over dinner and spend time socializing afterwards at the dinner table sometimes for hours. It was considered rude or against the etiquette to excuse yourself from the table outside of going to the restroom or for something brief like a cigarette break maybe. Peter and Dominic happened to pick up on the gatherings and the way those attending played into the rules of their social class, leading to the thieves realizing that they could rob those people's houses while they were downstairs eating and socializing. And that's exactly what they did through the 1960s and 70s and a little bit of the 80s. Peter would scale to the second story of these houses and mansions while Dominic played the lookout role, making sure nobody headed to the upstairs portions of the houses. If somebody started to head upstairs or if there was any potential danger heading their way, Dominic would use a light whistle to alert Peter. See, they had a simple but sharp plan that they would execute in stealing jewelry, cash, and valuables, while their victims were just downstairs adding inches to their waist and inflating their egos. They kept their burglaries to around three minutes, which is actually longer than I need if you remember what I was saying earlier about coming and going. No shame in my game and surely no shame in the dinner sets game either. Latella always gave Salerno the credit for being a mastermind and having a sixth sense to find where the valuables were always stashed in such a short span of time. They would find their potential targets on who's who's lists and Forbes magazine with one of their notable victims being the Pillsbury family. At the height of their criminal enterprise, the dinner set gang was stealing an average of about $250,000 worth of valuables per job. The FBI estimated they were responsible for several hundred burglaries, with the total value of their haul ranging from $75 million to a staggering $150 million in stolen jewels. However, the estimated amount is only an estimate as their true haul was never fully figured so it's not clear whether all the crimes were truly their work or the work of copycat thieves. That never deterred the work of detectives Billy Adams and Jim Hirsch, who stayed on the trail for the dinner set gang for decades. During their tenure, they also robbed the founders of Reader's Digest magazine while they were downstairs having dessert. Another notable robbery was north of Palm Beach and Home Sound, which is exclusive only to the incredibly rich. There's only a single road in and out. Because of that, Peter and Dominique decided to invade that property by raft. They then broke into the mansion upstairs while the DuPont family was downstairs having dinner. The gang wound up stealing $12 million in rare carrot diamonds and sapphires. They would go to New York to fence their jewelry to a guy named Wally Gans. Gans was a true jewelry expert from the Manhattan Diamond District, 
but he was also an underground fencer, so he knew how to extract the most cash out of their jewelry hauls. Even after fencing fees and kickups to some of their mobbed-up associates, Peter and Dominique Latella were still coming away with large sums of money. I can't go into detail about every robbery because they did commit hundreds and most robberies follow the same M.O. Over time, they attempted to go legit, but they started to run out of money after living a somewhat lavish lifestyle. They opened a construction company, but it crumbled with the economy during the market crash of the 80s, and to make matters worse, Peter Salerno had developed a dangerous addiction to that very bad boogery sugar before winding up in prison for a short stint. When he got out, he found out his wife tragically had breast cancer. Gloria and him unfortunately had no insurance, and they certainly had no more money, especially for the critical treatments that Gloria needed. That led them back to their roots, and in 1991, they headed back upstate. They decided they were just going to start robbing without extensive research and without knowing all of their targets. Peter and Dominic began a rampage, attempting to rob 40 houses in a month once while attempting to summon enough money for his wife's treatments. They made a mistake and robbed one of the same houses they robbed 20 years prior, leading to the two earlier mentioned detectives realizing the boys were back in town. Yes, the boys were back in town. Finally, on the date of January 21st, 1992, their shining luck went from the clarity of a diamond to tarnishing silver in the quiet town of Westport, Connecticut. As Peter was scaling into a house, a woman who was home at the time heard them and called the police. Within minutes, the property was being swarmed with law enforcement and search dogs. Both Peter and Dominique knew their time was up and they were immediately arrested without any sort of violence or confrontation. Detectives Hirsch and Adams connected them to multiple crimes and were able to get them convicted, leading to Dominic serving nine years and Peter serving four years in prison. And by the way, Gloria did thankfully survive. This is one of the stories I truly enjoyed in the end because no one lost their life, which is always a positive ending. Have you ever wondered what would happen if you tried to rob a bank with lemon juice? Well, you won't have to because today we're going to talk about how two guys did just that. And what followed their crimes wasn't a testament to their genius. In fact, their crimes led to a study, an unflattering one. But we'll get into that a bit later. See, after the darker hour of my last video about the dirtiest dentist in the world, I wanted to go and jump into this lighter, kind of hilarious story about the greater 1995 Pittsburgh bank robberies. I have to be honest. There were times when researching and writing this story that I just couldn't stop laughing. I mean, I, I was cracking up. Look, I'm not here to insult the subjects of this story, but the lack of rationale is at times just too freaking funny. So for context, lemon juice can be used as an invisible ink. You can write on paper with lemon juice, but since it's colorless, you would need to use a hot light bulb to see the message. It's a pretty cut and dry trick. Well, the subjects of this citrus field case, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson learned about the invisible ink ability of lemon juice, and what do you know? They decided they were gonna become John Cena before John Cena became John Cena by using the lemon juice to make their faces invisible so that they could go and rob some banks while doing so unseen. And no, I'm not lying. And no, it didn't take much convincing for Willie to plan out the invisible lemon juice face heist as they tested the invisible masking lemon juice theory with a camera. And since it worked on a picture, that was supposedly enough to convince them with confidence that they had discovered a way to become the ultimate bandits. However, it's been said that the lack of sight from the picture was poor evidence in itself because there were numerous reasons with the camera alone as to why the picture may have come out blank, ranging from light contrast to the aiming of the lens. But there was no convincing Wheeler and Johnson as they had now found a way to stay out of sight, at least in their minds. Also, I personally would like to know why they didn't at least just test the lemon juice on each other to see if they would be invisible to one another. I think Will Ferrell and John C. Riley should make this movie, but it should be a sequel to Step Brothers kind of a thing, you know? It fits right in. See, these two guys thought they found the equivalent of splitting the atom, but for bank robbers. They literally believed they would vanish without a trace, you might say. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry for the quip, but I had to. 
I wouldn't say they were men who believed that the devil was in the details, because their eventual plans to rob a couple of banks were simple, as they were going to be invisible, remember? So there was no need for an intricate heist or blueprints and explosives or busting into a vault, nothing like that. Wheeler and Johnson decided they were going to squirt lemon juice on their faces, walk right in and rob the banks at gunpoint, and because of the juice, no one would be able to see their faces. It would be like getting robbed by the wind. You wouldn't see it coming and you wouldn't see them going. You would only feel the cool breeze of a barrel demanding the cold hard cash from the register. I mean, how could this fail? Out of all the high stories in history, none seemed as bulletproof as this one. <laughs> this is too much fun. I'm sure they felt brilliant as they were going to save $30 on real disguises, instead spending probably only a dollar back then for some good old fashioned sour lemon juice. In hindsight, the initial investment of their crimes was probably less than a dollar from the both of them outside of their weapons. Plan in place, MacArthur Wheeler and Clifton Earl Johnson decided to finally act on January 6th of 1995. First, they headed towards the Swiss Bell branch of Mellon Bank. Faces covered in lemon juice ready to rock and they robbed it at gunpoint for almost $5,500. Then, they headed towards the Fidelity Savings Bank in Brighton Heights, loading up with more squirts of lemon to the face before robbing the bank in the exact same manner. However, I couldn't find a consistent total and I do apologize for that. Again, these weren't fancy or violent robberies that turned into pursuits or shootouts, so there isn't much detail to cover there. They literally went in with lemon juice on their bare faces for the cameras to see and capture, and that's exactly what happened aside from the stealing of a little bit of the moolah. Wheeler was almost immediately arrested as his face along with Johnson's were plastered everywhere from all the modern surveillance in the banks that they had just robbed. To their shock and surprise, the lemon juice didn't do its part and now they were going to prison. That lemon juice sure was an unreliable accomplice. Funny enough, and allegedly, when the cops were showing Wheeler pictures and video of himself committing the robberies, he claimed in a surprising tone, but I wore the lemon juice. <laughs> And I, I don't know if that's true, but it sure is hilarious. And Johnson was arrested a few days later. Johnson immediately flipped on Wheeler and testified against him for a more lenient sentence. So not only was Wheeler betrayed by the lemon juice, but support from his partner Clifton Johnson was now as invisible as the ink they were hoping to imitate. Wheeler was sentenced to 24 years in prison, while Johnson served only a little over five because he became a big fat snitch. Now. The media and public were fascinated by their lack of awareness, but two scientists were especially enamored. The curious case of the lemon juice bandits triggered the scientific mind of psychologists David Dunning and Justin Kruger to research the confidence Wheeler had in his lemon juice theory, as they were somewhat baffled that anyone would actually believe that they could use lemon juice as a cloaking device, let alone while in the midst of committing a federal crime. I'm sure some of you have heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect, which I believe states that people with limited info or competence levels can sometimes become so overconfident in an area that they know nothing about only because they discovered some surface information, so they overestimate what they're capable of. I want to be clear that there is obviously more complexity to the Dunning-Kruger effect as a whole. There have been studies since then that have questioned the theory. I'm not a psychoanalyst and I'm certainly not going to try to sound like one. The point and humor of this story to me was that their mini crime spree literally helped inspire a scientific theory about the lack of one's self-awareness and basically how it may lead you to overestimate your abilities. As I said in the beginning, this was incredibly unflattering to become the subject of a theory of such. Thankfully, no one was killed or hurt during the robberies and so this story ultimately turned into an almost comical take on how to not rob a bank. This wasn't a long story as there isn't much detail about the men outside of their ultimate heist plan. The fact that the Dunning-Kruger effect was inspired by Mr. Wheeler was enough for me to have to tell this story. There's something about the former president of the United States, Richard Nixon, and his complex relationship with the one-time Teamsters president, James Jimmy Hoffa, that managed to fixate a group of thieves from Ohio into planning a robbery all the way in California. And we're going to find out why. First, let's take a look back at some of the history between Nixon and Hoffa for a bit of context. From what I could find, 
they developed a professional and political relationship starting in the 1950s. Jimmy Hoffa was clearly a large leading force behind the typical voting direction of his union members, making him a powerful ally for those running for office, especially a presidential candidate. This was a time when our country, from a political standpoint, still respected the hard-working hands of our blue-collar communities. A time where the influence of politics wasn't always driven through the scope of corporations and rich donors with large interest groups that could pound away with the media and smearing the working class. We used to celebrate labor workers for their essential work and backbreaking jobs that still to this day make the world go around like those of truckers and bricklayers. So their votes were appreciated and essential to all candidates on both sides of the political spectrum. With their working relationship intact, Jimmy Hoffa agreed to back Richard Nixon for president during the presidential campaigns in 1960. James Hoffa's support came with an alleged gift of money totaling $1 million in the form of two $500,000 payments in cash being delivered to the former president. That wasn't all. It's also alleged that in 1971, Jimmy Hoffa had another $300,000 sent as a bribe to Richard Nixon again. This time to commute Hoffa's prison sentence, which he was serving for, ironically, misusing Teamster funds and jury tampering. We now know that there are rumors swirling around of large cash deposits in the United California Bank belonging to Richard Nixon, some that illegally came from Jimmy Hoffa. And if that wasn't enough, there was another rumor that emerged. A rumor supposedly coming from Hoffa himself, stating that there could be up to 30 million in total stashed at the same bank. Now, we officially know the reason for the thieves wanting to target a bank in California. They heard rumors that the bank they wanted to rob was the location of the illicit cash payments from Hoffa to Nixon, along with the other influx of money that was stashed there. And it was believed that the money was locked in safe deposit boxes in the vault. I'm not a math person, but if the 30 million is accurate, then back in 1972, that would have been close to the equivalent of about 243 million in today's dollars. Again, I tried to make sure the numbers were accurate, and if they aren't, I do apologize. That's ultimately where Emil Denzio decided to step in. Denzio was a career criminal, a master thief who was born in 1936 in the town of Groshen, Ohio. Denzio was described as being one of the most successful thieves in the history of the United States. Emil had a crew that was composed of typically him, his brother James Denzio, and their brother-in-law Charles Mulligan. Emil was an incredibly skilled alarm expert and his brother James was efficient in building bombs and using explosives. Emil Denzio had an interesting life to say the least, being convicted of several crimes through the years, even as recently as the 1990s for a robbery attempt, which was his last time, far past the intriguing history of this story. So finally, let's get to 1972 when a thoroughly planned heist equally rocked federal law enforcement in the city of Laguna Niguel, California. We have the already noted Denzio brothers and their brother-in-law Charles, the getaway driver on board. But for this job, they needed to add some expertise so they got their nephews Harry and Ronald Barber involved, as well as Phil Christopher, who was another alarm expert, and Charles Brokel. Brokel was brought on purely for strength in numbers as he possessed no real skill. They knew the planning had to be intricate as this was the crime that would become their legacy. Emil had received numerous tips including the supposed numbers for the security deposit boxes. And with that final detail of confidence, they decided it was time to make their move, so they traveled to Niguel Laguna from Ohio and began casing the bank. Upon their planning, they realized it would best be served in their favor to go through the roof into the vault, which would limit their risk of public exposure. Going through the roof was something that Emil and his brother James had perfected. They hit various scores through the years with numbers very much in the double digits as the brotherly duo were sincerely veterans in their field. With the complex logistics locked down, they decided to put their plans into action. The Thursday night before, they delivered their tools to the eventual scene of their crime. They then injected the alarm systems with an expanding foam to keep the clapping piece from tripping and alerting the authorities. Finally, it's Friday night on March 24th, 1972 and the crew is ready to strike. In first order, they plant dynamite on top of the bank's vault. They blow it open and scale down in. They immediately start busting open safe deposit boxes and quickly come across large amounts of cash, gold, and valuables. The totals of cash and value were adding up, but they ultimately found themselves well short of that elusive $30 million. And that is certainly not to undermine the total estimate of $9 million that they did get away with, while again considering the time, 
was equivalent to a far larger amount than what 9 million is now presently. They quickly gather what they've stolen and they head back out under the blankets at night. The scene was eventually discovered and it only baffled law enforcement. It was a testament to the detail and skills that each individual possessed in their role. It was a sign that these were true professionals with experience. This escalated into a frustrating case rather swiftly for the FBI, as the Denzio crew had almost committed a perfect crime, leaving no physical evidence to tie any of the robbers to the scene itself. That was until the FBI was able to link two robberies with similar tactics back to the explosive bandits back in Ohio. The feds found what they believed to be the place where they planned their criminal acts, in relation to one of the barber nephews. When the FBI searched the place, they found fingerprints on dirty dishes that they were able to trace back and match to the bandits. Warrants were eventually pushed out, the robbers were tracked down and soon picked up. Emil and James Denzio, Charles Mulligan, their nephews Ronald and Harry, along with Phil Christopher were all arrested. But good old Charles Brokel decided to rat on his partners in crime before entering the witness protection program. This crime was considered so brilliant that it has been romanticized in film and television, even as recently as 2019 in the film Finding Steve McQueen. Emil Denzio's acts didn't stop there though, but I'm going to deep dive into his life story on its own. The Southern California area is full of freeways, including the famous 405 giving robbers, crooks, and thieves of all sorts the various getaway routes that are essential to their master plans. A favorable place, if you will, if something needs doing that requires a quick exit. And by the 1980s, the Los Angeles area had become our country's bank robbing hub. See, bank robbery rates were skyrocketing across the nation, but even so, Southern Cali was still seeing an average higher than anywhere else, even with the inflated national numbers. In 1980 itself, wound up a peak year for the bank robbing scene down on the lower west coast. It was the year that Norco, a prideful American town outside of Los Angeles was set under siege when a religious fanatic and his crew decided to paint the streets red on the fateful and deadly day of May 9th. Now for context, we need to go back a little bit to the 1960s and 70s when fear was motivated in some people by the caution of a possible societal collapse due to the radical actions that had swept through the country the previous two decades, when liberation and radical groups were operating in full frontal public view. For example, the early 70s were a violent time that included serious acts of extremism including a total of well over 2,000 bombings. This is also coming from a time where the thought of nuclear war was burned into people's minds feeling a further paranoia. There was constant tension and propaganda everywhere, kind of like today, just minus the social media. It's not hard to imagine people being caught in extremism like this. The age of the internet has just helped spread sporadic extremist ideas faster than back then, but it hasn't changed the fact that people are still radicalized sometimes rather easily. You'll soon see how extremism drove these five armed individuals to follow through with their plan to rob a bank. Extremist ideologies have always spread and they always will, unfortunately. I know, I'm from Oklahoma City and I will never forget the horrific acts committed by a man that was brainwashed and driven by extremist ideologies. You all are familiar with April 19th, 1995, which took the lives of 168 people including several children. Now, let me introduce the eventual mastermind of this robbery, George Smith. He was once a military man who served for a couple of years overseas in Germany working with artillery. He was in his late 20s and someone who for a long time held strong atheist beliefs. He rejected societal norms, including religion, but that eventually changed with him becoming a Christian during the religious youth movements from his era, leading him into an obsession with the rapture and the apocalypse. Now listen, I'm not saying Christianity is extremism. Let me clarify that before I upset anyone. But almost all belief systems and cultures do typically have some form of an extremist subculture, which is what George's beliefs quickly escalated towards. He was able to sway people with his extreme biblical beliefs and apocalyptic prepping propaganda. Because of such, a man named Chris Harvin, who George worked with, was soon intrigued by him. I mean, Chris was absolutely captivated by George Smith. You could basically say they eventually built a platonic life with one another when they bought a house together in Mariloma. I'm not insinuating anything intimate between the two, nothing intimate that I've found, 
I know it was more of just a kindred spiritual vision that brought them closer than blood. Their bond over the world possibly imploding into an orderless society of chaos was like mixing baking soda and vinegar. It was bound to explode before eventually fizzling out. Chris Harvin was now swayed with George. George Smith's preaching was simple. As a former dreamer of anarchy, he went through a metamorphosis, trading his furious rebellion for a religious fixation. Preaching that almost every single action should benefit one's need of preparation for the impending rapture or a possible nuclear showdown between the United States and the Soviet Union. And George's plans were originally just as simple. Reject society, prep for doomsday, and cash in on their marijuana harvest. But the harvest didn't work out. Now, past the radical 60s and 70s, there was another boom sweeping our nation. The bank robbing boom was now being felt up and down the streets like an earthquake and it wasn't showing any signs of slowing down. So couple the bank robbing boom with George Smith and Chris Harvin's obsession with the apocalypse and the failure of their marijuana revenue together and you get some desperate men ready to raise the stakes for the money they need to fund their doomsday prepper lifestyle. Which almost sounds like something that would become a reality show nowadays. Their financial desperation and religious paranoia quickly led them down the road of planning a bank robbery on George's orders. And their first order of action was now to start recruiting. Soon after, the crew was set, including George Smith, the one-time artillery hotshot now turned apocalyptic preacher as their boastful leader. Chris Harvin, George's trusty cliché sidekick. The Delgado brothers, composed of Billy and Manny, and finally Russell Harvin, Chris's brother. George was obviously the man that was going to be responsible for planning their operation as well as building the bombs, which were IEDs. They began their preparations for the robbery with Smith casing the bank in its layout. He was orchestrating a plan to be in and out within two minutes and not a single second more. They began stockpiling weapons and ammo, from shotguns to rifles. Russell and the Delgado brothers were tasked with stealing a van, which they eventually stole from Gary Hakala after kidnapping him in a mall parking lot. With their weapons and getaway vehicles secured and ready, they were excited to set their plan in motion. The first act was to set the bomb off close to the site of the robbery beforehand and create a diversion, before the final act of actually robbing the bank. The days arrived. It's May 9th, 1980. They set out on their way a little after three in the afternoon, armed and vigilant. First, the robbers stop and they plant the bomb. They realize it's not gonna detonate, but with desperation at hand, they decide to go ahead with the rest of their plan without the diversion. The men arrive at Security Pacific Bank Branch covered from head to toe, barged to the front doors with their guns cocked and ready for action. Russell Harvin forces an employee to the vault and gathers some cash while the others dictate the customers in the lobby area. They wind up with around $20,000 without firing a shot inside the bank. With their two minutes up, they quickly exit, but as luck had it, there were police in the immediate area that were already responding to calls nearby. Deputy Belaski arriving first, immediately started taking gunfire and returning it back at the bandits who were unleashing automatic rounds. Belaski struck George Smith in the lower body and hit Billy in the neck. Billy was now gone, leaving the rest of the crew with no getaway driver. The robbers still firing eventually struck Belaski, severely injuring him as Deputies Hill and Deputy Delgado arrived, not to be confused with the criminal Delgado brothers. The deputies were able to save Belaski and get him away from the ongoing storm of bullets. From there, the group of robbers hijacked another vehicle and started exchanging gunfire with Deputy Delgado again. With all the violence immediately ensuing after the robbery, the money wound up left behind. The robbers were now empty-handed with only their lives to fight for. During the pursuit, the robbers showed no remorse for anyone in their way including civilians and law enforcement. Another victim of gunfire that day during the street pursuit was Deputy Parks, who was able to survive. For context, the robbers did say that they didn't intend to hurt the police, as they were just trying to take their vehicles out but they injured almost a dozen people including a child during the chase. And as if things couldn't get crazier, the crew of heavily armed bandits started shooting at a police helicopter that was aiding in the pursuit. Bullets struck the helicopter and it had to make an emergency landing. The robbers kept fleeing and headed towards Little Creek Canyon in the San Gabriel Mountains. Unfortunately though, tragedy is about to strike. As more police units had joined the pursuit, a one deputy Jim Evans was closing in. 
Jim Evans was a decorated ex-military service member and proud member of law enforcement. As he approached their vehicle, the robbers took position and outgunned the deputy, taking his life, solidifying their fate as cop killers. As soon as they ended their attack on the fallen Jim Evans, they turned their attention towards Deputy Jim McCarty, who originally was behind Jim. McCarty had an automatic weapon and was able to defend himself against the crew of killers until reinforcements showed up. After a day of shootouts and now on the run in the wilderness, George was starting to weaken due to blood loss from all of his injuries. Finally, SWAT closed in and apprehended the criminals without nearly any more conflict. George Smith and the Harvin brothers gave up without any further fight, but Manny Delgado, still armed, was taken out by SWAT members. The remaining suspects were now in custody with only tire tracks, bullet casings, and blood littering their trail. All three remaining robbers, George Smith, Chris Harvin, and Russell Harvin were charged with several crimes, leaving all of them with life sentences in prison. May 9th, 1980 was a day that was paved into the streets and the hearts of all those negatively affected. Because when violent crimes happen, there's usually victims with families. It's the families that ultimately pay the price. Hello, and thank you for stopping by. Today's subjects are what movies are made of, because these guys were at one time stars in the bank robbing field before taking an eventual darker turn. I don't mean to glorify anyone, but they liked the action as much as Bruce Willis, and that's what makes the reputation of the Boyd Gang stand out historically in the world of stick-up men. The Boyd Gang loved money, they loved robbing, and they loved having a generally good time by their standards. Their name was derived from the media's love for the Hollywood-looking fearless and always eager Edwin Alonzo Boyd, who was proclaimed as their leader. However, it's said that the brainiac and organizing factor was in fact another member of the gang named Lenny Jackson. I couldn't help but feel like it was rightfully named after Boyd himself. You'll see why. Aside from Lenny and Edwin, the gang also included a man named Valent Lesso, who went by the alias of Steve, as well as another gentleman named Willie Jackson, who had no relation whatsoever to Lenny. I want to clear that up from the get-go. From what I could find, these guys originally met in the Don Jailhouse, which is in Canada, in the year 1951. I ask that you bear with me as I could not find details for every single robbery, but we will certainly dive into their most notorious robberies as these guys were running rampant during the middle of the 20th century. Anyways, Edwin Boyd was from Canada, born in 1914 and ironically, his father wound up working for the Toronto Police Department. While in school, Edwin kept himself busy with after-school activities and music and band, though he never really excelled from an academic standpoint. By 1933, he was arrested for the first time, leading to a short stint in jail, and in 1936, he attempted to rob a store, but he failed. He soon was enlisted into the Royal Canadian Regiment, which is a branch of their army. While stationed overseas, he met his eventual wife, Doreen Mary Frances Thompson, who had a secret first child that she hid from Edwin in the beginning. Edwin, though, came to adopt her first child after he was introduced. Then, they had a child together almost a year later. But tragically, they lost their newborn son during an air raid that critically injured their infant. Soon after, Edwin Boyd transferred over to the Canadian Provost Corps in 1942 before successfully having twins with his wife a year later. Finally, in 1945, he was discharged from the service after the war ended. By the late 1940s, Edwin Boyd and his wife were back living in Canada where Boyd struggled to find a good job to provide for his wife and young children. Ultimately, Edwin Alonzo Boyd decided that by any means necessary, he was going to put food on the table for his family, even if that meant turning to crime. On September 9th, 1949, he made a decision that you can't come back from, a decision that could potentially lead to multiple convictions and a long sentence behind bars. That decision was to rob a bank, and that bank was a branch of the Bank of Montreal for a grand total of $2,256 which was by no means chump change back in the 1940s. See, he was pretty confident in his robbing skills because of his military and motorcycle riding experience. He considered himself someone who enjoyed indulging in more adrenaline-driven activities, so bank robbing was going to be right up his alley. In hindsight, he had just fought in one of the largest world wars in history, 
He had already suffered horrible and personal tragedies, so in a sense, he probably felt things could obviously be much worse than the potential of being arrested. So to him, the risk was probably worth it. As tough as he was, he still decided to have a couple of alcoholic beverages before partaking in his first robbery because he had the first time jitters. So, a little buzzed, he walked into the bank, pulled out his Luger from the war after handing over a note declaring that this was in fact a good old fashioned stick up. As he was running out of the bank of Montreal, the manager began a foot pursuit after Edwin, but he got away. And by the time the police were passing by him, he had discarded his simple disguise of makeup. Then in 1950, Edwin wound up on the stroll again looking for a new bank to rob, this time with more prior effort and planning. Hoping things would go smooth from start to finish, from stick up to getaway. This time his victim was a branch of the Canadian Bank of Commerce. He followed the same procedure of robbery though, simply handing over a note as he brandished his prized German Luger. Now adding a little bit more of his own antics, jumping on the counter, being a little bit more demanding. His total cash break was a little more than the last haul at a total of $2,862. After a couple successful robberies, he reluctantly told his wife, but she was accepting of it. And by the middle of the year, he saddled up and robbed the Dominion Bank for a little of over $2,000. Later that year, he wound up trying to rob another bank in North York, but the bank manager intervened and got hold of his gun. Edwin Boyd had to charge that attempt to the game as he got away with nothing, not a single dollar. In fact, he was lucky to escape with his life because the bank manager turned into Dirty Harry and started ringing off shots at Edwin after he wrestled away possession of the pistol. Barely a year later, after he originally started his bank robbing spree, he returned to the scene of his first major crime. He returned to the Bank of Montreal to rob it once again. After a while, he met a degenerate alcoholic named Howard Galt. They became friends. Together, along with his younger brother Norman Boyd, the three went and robbed another bank for a total close to $10,000. And obviously during that era, that was a nice cash grab. Unfortunately for Edwin, Howard was not built with the same composure that Edwin was, and Edwin was about to fall victim to the incompetent of Mr. Galt. They decided to rob yet another bank, and after settling without a serious plan in place, they ran in and to the surprise of Edwin, Howard started going crazy. He became erratic, and by the time Edwin had convinced Howard to flee, the police were on the way. Edwin was able to escape at first, but Howard was snatched up like a puppy by its neck and started barking off details about his former friend Edwin Boyd. Edwin was soon arrested and confessed to his part in multiple robberies. He was sent to the Dawn Jail which was a notorious and dangerous Canadian detention center before it was closed in 1977. While in jail, Edwin Alonzo met Lenny and Willie, both whom were violent thieves themselves. Almost instantly, they began trading stories. One important detail about Lenny was that Lenny had a fake false foot which he would store saw blades inside of. A Little bit of context for later. The three decided they should break out of jail together and on November 4th, 1951, they set their plan in motion, sawed out some window bars and scaled down the side. Their plan involved them being picked up by the earlier mentioned Steve, but he was nowhere to be found before ultimately showing up late. It didn't take long for the convicts to plan and execute a couple of bank robberies, one a Bank of Toronto and the other one a Leaside Royal Bank. However. The police were looking for them already for their escape and had assumed it was them that had committed the above mentioned two robberies. It is important to note that the gang as a whole, they did not like each other. There was jealousy. Most of the guys seemed to have a superiority complex in one way or another. They all cared about their reputations both personally and in the description the media was displaying about them. Willie was eventually arrested, but he kept his mouth shut. Afterwards, Willie had a younger brother who joined up with the gang, and his name was Joe. The gang was now mainly Edwin, Steve, and the younger brother of Willie. They robbed a bank together. Then they robbed another bank, this time with Steve's girlfriend, a woman named Mary. What they didn't know though was that Mary was a snitch, even though she was related to Lenny. She was informing to the police. She told the police about their getaway car, which belonged to the mother of Steve's child the true love of Steve's life, a woman named Anna. On a fateful day, 
Lenny and Steve were driving and tragically, because of the information that Mary had shared with the police, a Detective Tong and Sergeant Perry were patrolling the streets when they spotted the supposed getaway car. They pulled them over and as Detective Tong approached the black car, shots were fired from the car striking Tong in the chest, critically injuring him and striking Perry in his arm. The thieves got away and the policemen were rushed to the hospital where Tong sadly passed away. After fleeing, Mary tipped off the police about Steve. The police raided Steve's apartment and shot him, but it wasn't fatal. Lenny was also found in an apartment, but Lenny got into a shootout with police. They wounded Lenny multiple times before his pregnant wife talked him into surrendering. Finally, a detective with known integrity, Adolphus Payne, set his sights on the last known member of the Boyd gang, Edwin himself. Through grimy and time-consuming detective work, Adolphus Payne was able to discover a vehicle that was transferred to Edwin Boyd's wife from Norman, unwittingly. Norman and his wife were attempting to sell the car, and as fate would have it, the detective called the ad for the car and wound up speaking to Norman. The police said they were interested in purchasing the car, so they said they would only purchase it from the original owner of the car, that being Edwin's wife, Doreen. So Doreen came over, got a fake check that was setting up the plan so they could get to Edwin. And it was successful as Doreen went and picked up Edwin afterwards and the police surveilled them. They found where Edwin was being harbored and on March 15th, 1952, the police raided the house during the early morning hours. Edwin was arrested without any violent altercations. The whole gang was now convicted, including good old Mary the Singing Canary, as her snitching didn't give her immunity. By the order of their justice system, the original members of the gang were in prison together again. The whole gang was back together, you could say. Edwin, Lenny, Steve, and Willie. To nobody's surprise, they followed the same historical road as before and planned an intricate prison break. This time, on September 8th, 1952, the gang escaped and forged into the Don Valley. And for a little context, the guards did take Lenny's fake foot this time. So he had to run through the wilderness with a cup over his stump. He really was tough and persistent though, I'll give him that. Somehow or another, Steve left the gang for a bit and came back with a new foot for Lenny. And I, listen, if, if you could go and find a false foot for your friend in that time period, I mean, hell, even in this time period, hey, you're a great friend. So let's give Steve some kudos. Anyways, he brought Lenny his new foot and then he brought some weapons and new clothes for everyone. But as luck would have it, some farmers saw them tracking and mistook them for homeless people and reported them out of suspicion. The police showed up to a barn and without alarming the criminals, caught them without any more further violence. They were immediately put on trial and by the end of 1952, Lenny and Steve were hanged over the death of Detective Tong. Edwin was eventually released for good behavior in 1966. Before his death in 2002, Edwin confessed sadly that he had killed two people before robbing banks, but the police couldn't get an investigation done before his passing. I hope you all enjoyed this story. I truly hope that the victims of their crimes found peace. I also want to clarify that I would never glorify the actions of criminals, but their story is exactly what you would typically want from a good bank robbing movie. Sadly, this wasn't film or fiction and people lost their lives. The Depression era was a notorious time in American history, a time that left many people hopeless with the only guarantee being that of despair. Jobs as well as wages were disappearing, stocks were dropping, and banks were getting robbed. The dark cloud that started raining down on Thursday, October 24th, 1929, until the following Tuesday of October 29th, 1929, altered our economic trajectory with the beginning of the Great Depression. During that time, the Federal Reserve also raised the interest rates, inflicting further hardships on the American people, enhancing the harsh realities of those already living in poverty or working lower class blue collar jobs. This wasn't just a domestic issue either. This became an international problem, which transformed some countries into hotbeds of nationalism and fascism. 
Even the end of Prohibition in the 1930s didn't ease the economic shortcomings the way our government had hoped it would. This led to an uptick in criminal gangs that focused on good old-fashioned bank robberies. See, people were bitter towards the banking system and Federal Reserve at the time due to folks losing their way of life, their farms, and their homes. It's not unheard of in human nature for action or retaliation when people are desperate, bitter, or even just envious. Which takes us to the criminal underworld of the Depression-era gangsters that made Robin Hood look softer than a wet loaf of bread. Outlaws during that time figured in how much it would benefit their crimes and reputation if they added automatic weapons and fast cars to their arsenals. Creepy Alvin Carpus and Fred Barker were two eager outlaws who believed it was their duty to steal money back from the systematic institutions that were starving their families and fellow citizens. And that is where this story takes us today as we break down the Barker Carpus gang. Fred Barker was born in Missouri before relocating with his family to Oklahoma in the early 1900s. Fred came from a family of people that thrived on criminal behavior. His siblings were known gangsters locally and his mother, Mob Barker, was a reputed criminal too. It didn't take long for Fred's first arrest in 1927, which to no one's surprise was for burglary. It was during that time in prison that he met Alvin Carpus in the Kansas State Penitentiary, which was located in Lansing, Kansas. They struck up a friendship, even though there was a defined contrast in their personalities as Fred was more outgoing and likable, while Alvin had a deadly reputation and awkward personality. After their release in 1930, they decided to team up and start a gang. Among the other members was Fred's brother Doc Barker, Lawrence Duvall, Frank Nash, Harvey Bailey, Bernie Phillips, Fern Miller, Harry Campbell, and William Weaver. Oh, and uh, Ma Barker as well. Shortly after their release from prison, they went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Fred and Alvin were caught and arrested again in 1931 for stealing. Seems to be a little bit of a pattern here. Barker eventually escaped from prison, but Carpus pled guilty to the charges and served his four-year sentence before eventually going and meeting his partner in crime up in Missouri. Not long after that, tragedy struck on November 8, 1931 in the town of Pocahontas, Arkansas. While Fred Barker and some members of the gang were driving around the small town looking for a place to hit a score, they stopped so Weaver could take a leak. While he was relieving himself, a town law enforcement official named Manley Jackson started writing down their license plate numbers. While doing so, he was caught by Fred Barker and kidnapped before being driven out of town and executed with several shots to the back. Some context about the death of Manley Jackson was that his death wasn't attributed to the Barker Carpus gang until decades later. Originally, two men named Lige Dame and Earl Decker were convicted of Manley Jackson's death. Then maybe a month later, they were also the culprits behind the death of a sheriff from West Plains, Missouri named C. Roy Kelly. Now, what we know so far is that this gang is violent, they're killers, and they are indiscriminate of their victims and I say that because it's usually pretty common knowledge that you don't shoot or kill law enforcement as it's almost a guaranteed death sentence, rather from other police or lethal injection. Or I guess the electric chair for referencing their times. From Missouri, they went to Minnesota where they originally met Frank Jelly Nash. Nash was a skilled bank robber and he was always eager to show his talents. That was when the gang truly developed their identity, which became synonymous with their name, and that was robbing banks and kidnapping. 1932 was a prominent year for the gang as they suggested they robbed at least 11 banks, but it is believed that the number was much higher than that. However, 1933 was a special year for the gang as they decided to evolve into a more dangerous gang. A gang that requires more patience. Instead of just going in and robbing banks in a matter of minutes, they decided to start kidnapping prominent men for ransoms. The first victim of their new entrepreneurial expedition was William Ham, And he was an heir to a rich family from Minnesota that owned a brewery. Surprisingly... He was released without any real harm after they received their ransom of $100,000, which in 1933 was equivalent to about $2,400,500 today. So I would say that was no small catch. On August 30th, 1933, 
they robbed a bank in St. Paul. During the robbery, they got into a gunfight with officers John Yeaman and Leo Pavlak. Officer Pavlak lost his life, but Yeaman survived within an inch of his after suffering several gunshot wounds, including one to the face. Then, the second kidnapping victim was Edward George Bremer Jr. He was president of a bank in St. Paul, Minnesota. They were brutal during his kidnapping, both pistol whipping him and assaulting him in different ways. They eventually leveraged around 200000 out of that ransom, but they made a mistake. Doc Barker left his fingerprints on a gas can where they swapped Edward Bremer Jr. for the ransom money. Aside from the fingerprint, Alvin Karpus was then awarded the infamous title of Public Enemy No. 1, adding even more public speculation to their whereabouts. The heat was on the gang now, and it was simmering like a southern fish fry, so they decided to split up. It's also important to note that they killed one of their associates, a man named George Zegler, who had began telling people about their kidnapping of Edward Bremer Jr. George Zegler was executed on March 22nd of 1934 by his associates because he had become a loose end who couldn't keep his mouth shut. But what they didn't realize when they left his body is that Zegler had a ton of their information on him including names, addresses, and aliases used to evade capture, which offered law enforcement far more extensive leads than what they had previously had. Arthur Barker was caught in early January 1935 and sent to prison. Then, on January 16th of 1935 near Lake Ware in Florida, the police tracked Maul and Fred Barker and got into a shootout with them. It's estimated that 1,500 rounds were fired during the violent exchange. Fred and Ma Barker were killed that day. While on the run, Alvin Karpis managed to rob a train in Ohio before getting in a shootout with police himself in New Jersey and barely escaping. Soon after, Karpis was hiding out in Hot Springs, Arkansas because it was a known sanctuary for criminals due to the corruption of the town officials. But in March of 1936, the police raided a house in Hot Springs that they believed belonged to Alvin Karpis. Upon their raid, they discovered Alvin had already booked it down to New Orleans. Soon after that, though, Alvin Karpis and his luck ran out as he was tracked down and arrested on May 1st of 1936. He eventually pled guilty to his crimes, including kidnapping. Arthur Barker, he died in 1939 during an attempt to escape prison. Alvin Karpis was released from prison after serving 33 years and he eventually died in 1979. Unfortunately, this is one of those stories that ended up with the lives of multiple people being lost. However, I do hope you enjoyed this gritty but short story about the Depression Era gangsters. As always, thank you for watching. Please stick up the like button, subscribe, and have a wonderful rest of your day.